so I want to uh, just thank everybody for coming today. Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the Gordon Murray Caregiver Program here at UCSF, the Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program, and the Milton Marks Family Camp, um, who all came together uh, to put on this actually first of its kind three-part parenting workshop for people with brain tumors. So we're really excited about this offering. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Margareta Page. I am a, a, a career uh, neuro-oncology nurse who currently um, co-directs and serves as the nurse coordinator uh, for the Gordon Murray Caregiver Program. And I'm joined this afternoon by uh, Dr. Abby Marks, who's a clinical psychologist, who I actually met um, as she journeyed with her husband through his diagnosis of a glioblastoma, while together they co-parented three young boys. Um, Abby has a private clinical practice here in San Francisco where she works with families who have a parent uh, with a serious illness. Um, she's also founded and she directs the amazing Milton Marks Family Camp, which is a weekend camp for uh, neuro-oncology patients and families with kids. So in addition to Abby, we're joined today by Lacey Fetting, uh, who's a licensed clinical social worker here at the Cancer Center at UCSF. Lacey has a strong interest in supporting couples uh, who are facing serious illness while parenting. And then lastly, we're joined by um, Amy Arms, who's a licensed. But I believe we may have lost Margareta. So we'll just wait until she rejoins us. Um, and if that doesn't happen in a few minutes, I may take over. I guess I could finish my own intro. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. <laughs> I helped out at um, Milton Marks camp a couple of years, a few years now. So happy to be here and meet you all. Great. Great. Welcome. And then we have Naomi and Mary uh, who work uh, with me and their survivorship and supportive care services here at UCSF. And they'll be doing sort of our back end support today. So before we get started, I just want to, I like, I think we all just think, take a minute um, just to invite you to settle in and fully arrive at our, our session this afternoon. And if just take a moment to kind of let go of your morning and settle in to be here with us uh, for the next hour and a half. And so one nice way to do that is just take, just take a minute and let's all, uh, I invite you if you'd like to close your eyes or gaze softly at the floor and just for the next minute, we'll do a little breathing exercise. And one that I like is if you breathe in slowly through your nose for a count of three to four and then breathe out even more slowly, maybe double that count, maybe six to eight through your mouth. We'll just do that for about a minute. If you're ready, I invite you now just to open your eyes and let's just take a minute to think about what's happened um, and why it is that why you're here and what it is that brought you here today. Um, I guess for, for most of you, life was probably going along. You were balancing work and marriage, a social life. Um, you had kids or thinking about having kids. Probably you were sleep deprived um, and I'm sure you were facing a lot of demands and life was full and busy. And although it was busy, I'm, I'm imagining that most of you were enjoying your family and the joys and the challenges of parenting, right? And then boom, 
out of nowhere, um, the brain tumor appeared. And I think for a lot of you, that probably changed everything or, or many things. Um, certainly for adults, there's the shock of the diagnosis and um, there's this loss of, of a life that you had imagined. Um, I think for the parent with the tumor, I think in addition um, to facing this illness that has the potential to uh, threaten the very essence of, of who they are um, and how long they might live, a lot of times that person with the tumor is dealing with symptoms or side effects from the treatment, which might impact their ability to participate or be present um, in parenting in the ways that they were able to before the tumor. The parent who doesn't have the tumor is also grappling with the illness. Um, this is an illness that is life-threatening to their co-parent and their partner. Um, and it really can impact the essence of who that person is as a parent and a partner. And at different points, um, that parent is providing support uh, to the parent with the tumor, either due to their symptoms or, or maybe it's to allow that parent to focus on their treatment. And we know that a brain tumor, it's likely at least for some period of time, it will upset the balance and the rhythm that you two had going, you had established as co-parents prior to the diagnosis. We know that both parents worry about their health, their health and their future and the future of your family. And I think um, it's probably for that reason that you're all here today is that you are concerned about how this may impact your children um, and what you can do to support them and help them navigate and get through this. So that's why we're here today and for the next several weeks, because we do know that the diagnosis of a brain tumor, it adds a whole new dimension uh, to co-parenting. And we know it, it's not always easy. And in fact, for some, some things, it's pretty hard. Um, and those of us here today, we hope that over the next three sessions uh, that we'll be able to give you some tools uh, that are going to make uh, it a little easier, maybe make having some of those hard conversations a little more easy and make it a little easier to do some of the hard things. Um, we hope to teach you some skills so that you'll be able to practice some self-compassion um, and consider a shift for yourself, maybe from striving for perfection uh, to good enough. And then I think one of the, the biggest opportunities actually is to give um, all of you a chance to connect with some other parents who are in your same shoes. And that's exactly where we're gonna start today. Each week, we're gonna have some breakout sessions and we'll be dividing you into groups and we'll be having these groups um, each week, same groups uh, for all three sessions. And so I'd like to just have us go right into our, our first group and give us a chance uh, to get to know each other, okay? Are all the groups back? Great, okay, so I'm gonna just start my, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, um, it's so wonderful to see all of your beautiful faces and or screen names and think about um, all of you and so glad you're here to join us. So I thought we would just start out kind of as an extension about what Margareta was saying, just kind of getting on the same page with look at, uh, everything that your family is dealing with as you try to think about these conversations you want to have with your kids. Life is different than you thought it would be when you decided to have kids. Um, and for those of you who are still thinking about having kids and what that might mean, life is different than you thought it would be when you were going to have kids too. I just wanted to kind of name all of the things that, you know, are on your plates. Um, aside from your kids and talking with your kids. So medical appointments, financial stress from one or both of you having to take a leave from work um, or being able to work in different ways, things that, uh, the, how the brain tumor might affect um, the, the parent who has, who has it in terms of symptoms or um, being tired or being up to, uh, different kinds of things than they used to be, both parents because of the stresses of the tumor and just all of the um, other things you're dealing with, maybe being less available to your kids, even though you, you don't want to be. Not knowing what to expect about the future, not knowing what to expect about how it will be for your kids in the future. Um, we talked a bit about that in, 
in our group, all of the fears that you as parents have for your kids. A lot of times kids, when their parent is ill, will actually act out more. They'll be angrier. They'll refuse to do things more. Just at the time when things are harder for you, you may be grappling with your kid also being harder for you to handle. And then that just added to everything uh, that we consider the normal stress of parenting, even though sometimes those aren't normal, but huge, like meals, carpools, homework, and the global pandemic. So um, that's a lot. And in the middle of all of that, we're thinking about why, uh, about talking to your kids about ear illness, about brain cancer. So why is this hard? Why are you coming to something like this? Or why don't people know how to do this just automatically? Well, it's really hard. First of all, I think it's hard to talk to your kids about something about a brain tumor, which is something that you more than anything wish wasn't happening. It's really hard to let your kids know about something that you don't want to be true. Um, and I think sometimes not talking about what's going on can actually feel like you're protecting your kids. Um, that they can, kids are really great about just going about their normal days, wanting to do their normal things. And I think that sometimes it feels like telling them what's going on will disrupt all of that and, um, and almost make something true in their lives that doesn't feel like it has to be. Um, it can feel protective and it can also feel, I call this the shoot the messenger feeling. It can feel like you're, you're being the messenger of something that's really hard for your kids, almost as if you're causing it, if you're thinking about having a conversation. And most parents don't want this to be happening to their kids or in their lives. And so it feels like if you don't talk about it, maybe you don't, they don't have to deal with it. Um, also, I think just imagining those conversations, um, when you imagine them, Many parents say that what they imagine is how painful it's going to be for their child and the fact that they don't know how they'll manage that pain or be able to help their child through this um, when the illness then, you know, is out of your control. You can't make it not true. And then there's the question of will telling your children be traumatic for them? And that's a big worry as well. So with all of that in mind, um, oh, here's another worry. Um, parents worry that kids are going to ask something that is almost impossible for them to know how to answer. Like, what if they ask, are you going to die? But which is just a question that nobody really wants to answer. So with all of that in mind, all of those things going on, why is it important to have conversations with your kids? Well, a lot of times, even though they can act like they have no idea what's going on, their lives are just the same. Generally, kids do know something's up. And that can be that can be because they overhear conversations on the phone, even though you're quite careful not to talk about things in front of them. That can be because they're put, trying to put the pieces together about why they're seeing the symptoms that they have, why you're more tired, what was that time in the hospital about that we didn't quite understand. They're thinking about things, they already kind of know something's up, they feel their routines have changed, or just because kids are like sponges and they sense everything. And even though they might ha not have words for it, they might know that there's something confusing happening. So if they know that something confusing is happening and you don't, um, they don't, you don't talk to them about what's going on, they'll generally make up their own reasons or their own stories about what's happening in their own minds. And those might be things that are reassuring to them, but generally in the face of confusion, kids will make up their own stories that might even be more scary than what is going on. Um, and I can tell you some examples of those kinds of stories later. Another reason to talk to your kids about what's going on is that when we don't talk about things and they kind of suspect things are happening, they can feel like, um, oh, this must be something we're not supposed to talk about. It must be a taboo. It must be um, a subject that's so that will hurt somebody if we talk about it. And that is kind of the opposite of what we want, right? We want, we want to be able to have kind of natural, matter of fact discussions about everything that's going on. So they feel like if they're confused or if they're worried, they can come to you and ask you and you will 
tell them the truth about what's going on. So what is good about having open conversations? What's helpful about that for kids? First of all, talking with your kids about the cancer diagnosis or about any treatments or anything that's happening conveys, this is not too scary to talk about. This is not, there's no monster in the room that we can't talk about. This is something that's matter of fact and it can be handled and, and we can cope with it. Um, it also conveys to them that you want them to not be alone while they're, they're experiencing this, that you're all a family, that you're all in it together. Uh, having conversations with your kids, taking the time and effort to do that conveys to them that they're important. They're important enough in the family to know what's happening. And it also conveys an interest in what's going on inside of them. We wanna know the stories they're making up. We wanna know how they're thinking and feeling about what's happening. It makes them feel like they belong. And it also conveys that we as a family, that you as a family are open to questions and that questions aren't threatening, that, that no one is gonna be hurt by the feelings going on. Um, all right, so how to begin these conversations, how to talk about these things. So let's talk about this. The first thing you might wanna think about when you're thinking about having conversations with your kids is when. Um, and that, that's kind of a, that, that's like a no nonsense thing to think about, right? Um, this is gonna be different for every family, but the kinds of things you wanna talk about are, you don't wanna have a conversation and the, then have your kid have to rush off to something important um, that they're, you know, a test at school or even school in general, maybe. Although on the other hand, sometimes depending on the age of the kid, it's really great to have something planned afterwards that will be really distracting for them where they won't have to talk about it. They won't have to sit with hard feelings. Um, so it can't, it could be that you plan, you plan a family activity afterwards, having a talk and then going out for pizza or ordering in pizza or going on an outing that'll be really physical and allow them to kind of get their feelings out that way. Um, what else do you wanna think about? And I actually think this is one of the most important things that no matter what happens in the conversation, you know that you can have a tone that's calm and open and patient. A lot of people worry, a lot of parents worry that they might cry during the conversation and that is fine. Like it doesn't, that doesn't have to be in your control. Um, but even if you get emotional, you know you can be patient. You know you can be attuned to your child. Another important thing just to think about when you're thinking about talking about the illness is that it doesn't have to be this big kind of soliloquy or speech that you give. You can say things um, that are small, um, that are easy for your kids to kind of digest. You can say one thing and wait and see how they take it. Not everything has to be said at once. Mostly what I want you to think about is that you're opening a door to an ongoing conversation about this. And the most important thing is to communicate your patient, you're willing to hear what they think, you're willing to have them ask any question that they want, and this is not too scary to talk about. Communicate that questions are welcome, not just now, but if they go and think about this later, allow for them changing the subject or just leaving. This is especially true of little kids. Well, you know what? It's true of teenagers too. They just shut down. Uh, maybe you say one thing and they respond and it's just not the right time. And I think, you know, as with many things going on with kids when there's an ill parent, you know, having a parent who's ill, the one big way that that impacts your life or one of the big ways that that impacts your life is that you don't have, you can't choose. Um, you haven't chosen that that's happening. Your parents haven't even chosen that that's happening and you can't choose it for it to be different. And a lot of kids then feel like they need to be able to choose um, anything about other aspects of their life in order to make up for that. That's why we see a lot of kind of defiant behavior, for example. They wanna be able to choose um, and they're, they're sometimes they're angry. So if they if it's too much and too overwhelming for them to have uh, any kind of conversation, 
you can just let them choose to stop and you can choose a different time to talk about it more. Um, as I said, this is opening the door for an ongoing conversation. So you wanna be, you know, think about when you might need to keep them in the loop about what's going on um, with treatment, even if nothing is happening or, you know, um, the need to have different conversations will be ongoing too, for example, um, you know, if a treatment is starting, if radiation is starting, or if there's a new surgery, um, or even if you're going in for an MRI and have a result that you want to share that's positive, how you might communicate about that. As I said, conversations often evolve in stages. For some reason, I can't go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So general principles for having a conversation. I think I just mentioned some, but I want to tell you a little bit about kind of what form those conversations can have. And I also just want to say, it's not only kids who get overwhelmed. This, even what I'm saying to you might be really overwhelming. Um, it might be a lot to take in. Don't feel like you have to take it in. You'll have a copy of this with all of the slides uh, to review if you want to. And you can also ask questions. A number of us can be available after this meeting to talk you through things again. So general principles for having a conversation. I feel like the first thing that you want to do after you've you know, figured out the best time and kind of geared yourself up for that is just think of it, um, just think of the meeting as first, the first step as connecting with where your child is at. So for some kids, that could be tentatively offering something and then listening to where they're at, what stories they have about it. A lot of kids will want to share with you what they've been thinking. And then there's a lot of kids that absolutely won't and will just want to like sit and listen to what you have to say because it's too scary or it's too much. But you always want to think about kind of staying attuned to your child first thing. So part of that might be what have they already noticed? What are they imagining, thinking, or worried about? What are they confused about? And as I said, many kids will not tell you any of this and you'll have to just start. So um, a way of starting, if they won't tell you anything, is just to kind of like put yourself in your shared reality, you and them. So for example, Oh, sorry, I'll get to that in a bit. That's on another slide. So first, what do you, this, here's the recipe, connecting with them, uh, telling them what you think they might've might have noticed. So I'll give an example, even though it's on another slide. So you might say something like, um, you may have noticed that mommy's really tired a lot lately. Or, um, you know, we told you mommy had to go in the hospital or, um, or, um, uh, daddy's been losing his hair or something like that. Just to, to give you an example, to give them an example of what they already know about what's going on. Then in the second part of the conversation, you want to find a way of telling them what is happening. So it's the information you want to, you want to talk to them about whether about the brain tumor in general, or about the fact that there's a reoccurrence or about the fact that there's a new medication. So that's kind of the meat of what you're wanting to say. Then the things that kids will likely want to know about that after you've told them what's happening are um, what it means, what they're going to see um, in their parent and what changes that will mean in their life. Um, so what it means for their parent, what it means for all of you as a family. And this will help them feel more like they can predict what's happening. And then the last part of the conversation may be something like, what can we do to help? What does this mean for you in terms of contributing to the family? Or, you know, and another way of thinking about this is, I've just told you a lot of things that you don't have any choice about. Let's figure out what we do have a choice about here. So just to break this down a little bit more. So if the first step is what you might've noticed, I gave some of these examples already. Remember how mommy had to go into the hospital or, you know, how daddy's losing his hair or I know you've noticed mama is tired and been sleeping a lot. So those are all just things that will bring that will start the conversation with something that they already know. It orients them. I bet you're wondering why all of that happened. 
Did you know what was happening when mama was in the hospital? That must have been confusing. This is where you can draw them out about what they've been thinking or what they've been imagining or how scary or confusing it's been or how oblivious they were, what kind of answer that they had to all of that. What did you think was happening? So the second part is the part I think most parents need help with trying to put into words. This is the trickiest part where you name what's happening and you explain it. So um, we're gonna actually send you guys um, some very concrete examples of the kinds of things you might say. And I have to say, I find when I'm working with parents that when you see the language in front of you, that makes it that, you, that, um, that will work for something like this. Of course, you have to modify it for how you talk to your kids and how old your kids are and what they can understand. But as I think there's like an aha moment when people see, oh, this is something we can talk about and it isn't scary. That makes it actually more possible to think about having these kinds of conversations. So an example might be, mommy has something called a brain tumor. A tumor is cells that have grown wrong and are taking up space in her brain. And then you might, like, if you want to talk about surgery, you could say a doctor is going to help take them out with surgery. Um, that might be something that you say. And, you know, depending on what the, what you you know, your child, what they're going to want to hear, they might want to see a picture of the doctor. Um, they want, want to hear names. They might want to hear details or they might want to hear nothing. Here's another example of something you could say to talk about chemotherapy. When a brain tumor is taken out with surgery, little tiny pieces sometimes stay in there. They're too small even to see. So the doctor is going to help mom, give mommy medicine to kill them. And that medicine is called chemotherapy or radiation. I like, I like using real names with kids so that when they hear those names in the future, they know what they are. Um, so actually calling a brain tumor a brain tumor, calling something chemotherapy or radiation, I actually think it makes it less scary. Here's some more examples. So this is the part where you tell your child, what's the impact of all of this? You know, you've explained maybe what chemotherapy or radiation or recurrence is. And now you say, what does that mean for our family? So one thing you might say is when people get radiation to kill the tumor, Sometimes things taste or smell different for a little while. So mommy might not like the smells of some things. That's explaining something they're gonna see. Or daddy isn't gonna pick you up from school this week, grandma will pick you up instead. Those kind of things are so helpful for kids as long as if they know what's gonna change about their schedule, what's gonna change about their world, it makes them feel more safe and secure. And the last one is, just some ideas about how everyone can help or how we can connect through this, which is, which is what matters. It's their relationship with you that matters. It's their connection. So for example, if you're a patient, you might say, I love your drawing so much. Can you make me a picture that I can put above my bed in the hospital to make me smile thinking of you while I'm in there? Or if you're a caregiver, you might say, mama's pretty tired from the chemo. Let's pick out a fun movie for family movie night and we can all watch together. Okay, so in this part, I'm just gonna like go through some common questions that kids have when you're talking to them about things like this. And then what I'd really like to do is just kind of open the floor and see what kinds of conversations, I'm sure some of you have already had conversations with your kids and just kind of what, what kinds of answers have you had when things like that come up? So what is a brain tumor would be one. Is it cancer? What is cancer? What is surgery? What is chemotherapy? What is radiation? Why are you losing your hair? Do people die? Are you going to die? What is going to happen? How will my life change now? Can I talk about this? Is this a secret? So I thought I'd touch a little bit on how to talk to toddlers and preschoolers, because there's a really, that's a really hard conversation to just have with words. I mean, there are some books out there. I don't know if that's going to go out in the, in the resources that we are sharing with you, but I'll try to make sure some of those books get on there. But one really lovely method to talk to your kids about any, I mean, this is about a parent's illness, but really about anything 
is by doing um, interactive puppet shows. They're called puppet shows, but you don't need puppets. Generally, how I like to help parents to do this is just by thinking about your um, getting your kid uh, together with their stuffies or action figures or whatever it is. And what you do is you kind of create a cast of characters that are going to be in this show and you help them pick out a stuffy or an action figure for each character. So that might be the characters might be like it might be there's a family, there's a mommy, there's a daddy, there's a brother, there's a sister. It might be the doctor is one of the characters, depending on what you want to tell and how um, you know how involved you want to get, you know, your child, how how much they like to get into this stuff, how much they you know, or or how little tolerance they have for it. Then you want to create a story. And at first you're in charge of that story. So they choose the characters, but you tell the story and the story is of whatever it is you're trying to describe. So it might be about the mommy that's been, you, you again, you want to start with, with what they've noticed. Oh, my head hurts. If the mom, you know, that's what the, the bear says, you know, I need to go lie down or something they've noticed. And then you go through kind of what's happening or what's going to happen. There's a doctor, they're going to take to the hospital, they're going to make mommy feel better, whatever it is. You can also use the characters if they're a little bit older to create, um, to express feelings that the kids might be having. You know, you can say, oh, there's a, there's a, a brother and that's, you know, or there's a boy and the boy, he says, what's happening to my mommy? I'm confused. I don't understand, or I'm scared or whatever. You can have the whole story play out. And then the next step after that, and usually they're riveted by this, is that you do the story, you ask them if they want to do it again, only now they get to be involved. They can be a character. They can tell you what a character's feeling. They can change the story. So mommy doesn't go into the hospital. Instead, they go to Disneyland, whatever it is. And with the change of the story, it gives them control. And also it lets you know a little bit more about where they are at with it, what's in their mind. And often kids will ask, to have these stories again and again every night um, or every day, um, or you can come in and change the story based on whatever's happened. So with young kids, I'd say, you know, anywhere from, you know, three or four up to um, 10 or so. One of the things they might be worried about um, that might come up is, is this contagious? And obviously you can say no. And that's a worry. That's also a worry about could they get it? Or could somebody else get sick? Could their other parent get sick? Um, one of the things that you'll notice with young kids is um, that doesn't have to do with talking. It has to, that that's kind of wordless. Is you may notice that if if uh, you know if daddy's tired and has to go go lie, lie down, has a headache, they may also say they have a headache. Um, if somebody you know if one of the parents doesn't want to eat a certain food, they may find that you may find that they also don't want that food or they also have a stomach ache. And some of that is just their way of feeling into what's going on. And some of that is fear that they have. Um, with teenagers, um, obviously we could do a whole, a whole two hours on all of these different ages. I'm trying to just distill a little bit of what you might see to give you a heads up. Um, this is a really hard time to have a parent who's sick. I mean, no time is good. But one of the things that hard is that when you, you know, when you're a teenager, your big developmental task is separation. Who am I? And who am I that's different from my parents? What can I do that's different from them? Can I separate? Can I be separate from this family and my own person and still care about what's going on. Obviously, when there's a, a parent has a, an illness, it brings a family together. And sometimes that's really helpful for teenagers. And sometimes it's helpful and also hard. And sometimes it's just hard. Um, they also get really worried about what that means. Can I be my own person and want to do my own things and want to not care about what's happening with my parent? Because I want to stay just thinking about my own life. And oh my God, what if that's making them worse? What if mom or dad thinks I don't care about them? What if they're um, more depressed because of what I'm doing and that makes the illness work worse? Or um, did I somehow cause this by being rebellious? Or, you know, uh, kids of all ages often fear they might have done something to cause the illness. That's one of the things that's even more scary often than, than um, it can be helpful to have conversations because they can realize actually there's nothing they did. Um, to make this happen. 
chores and helping out, this is helpful for all ages, but I just find that um, even if you're not stating like, this is something we can all do to help somebody, you know, to help mom or dad feel better, um, actually having household tasks um, and things they can do, whether that's, you know, just a regular, you know, everybody cleaning up the kitchen together. So that's family time together, or whether that's, um, you know, the radiations really made dad feel like he doesn't want any of these kinds of foods. Let's think of something that might be really yummy and make it together, or whether that might be mom's really tired, can't do almost anything, but let's make a smoothie with her. Those are really good things you can do in ways of actually helping your child get through this. Okay, as we talked about before, any of these is just an opener to more ongoing conversations. Sometimes you can have conversations, I mean, obviously at a, a new diagnosis, during treatment, thinking about what's, what's to come, thinking about recurrence, any new symptoms that come up, and of course, at end of life. Um, we're not really touching on that right now, but if you um, have questions about any of that or any of those questions that come up, we can talk about them in the groups when we do breakouts in a minute. Okay, these are our breakouts. So what we're gonna do is get into our small groups that we were in before, and you can talk about anything, really anything that you heard uh, today that you wanna process, that you wanna think about. Um, how has talking with your kids been for you or how have you hesitated and what's scary about it? What kinds of things do you think would be hard to say or questions that your kids might ask that might be hard to answer? And we're gonna do a debrief afterwards. I'll stop sharing and we'll get into groups. Thanks, Abby. Um, and just to give you a little heads up of what we have in store for you for next time. So today we really just focused on just to begin those beginning conversations or having those conversations. And I think next time we'll spend a little bit more time focusing on how the tumor and maybe the, the treatment um, impact a family. So really thinking about the symptoms and some of the changes and, and then what that means. And, and then we'll, we'll talk just about some strategies that families can use um, to kind of navigate through and to continue just to dialogue. Um, so, so just to help build on what we learned today about conversations, how, how we can continue to do that uh, around symptoms, okay? So that's what we'll be doing next week. Um, if there's anything that you really wished uh, or thought about that, you know, we gave you a little um, questionnaire about what you were hoping from these, if there's something else that came to mind, um, we, if you want to hear anything, we invite you to let us know. Feel free to email us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and then I, I think what we'd like to do today is just, just take a minute to wrap things up with a little bit of a closing ritual. I would like to acknowledge Abby and Lacey and Amy and really uh, thank them for being with us today and sharing your knowledge and your presence. Um, and I'd like to just also acknowledge each one of you uh, for having the courage uh, to show up here because this you're, it takes you're brave to be here today. So, um, so let's just take a minute before we separate and just reflect on our time together. Um, and what I would like to do as we leave, I would like all of you to unmute yourself. And I'm going to go around and call on you. And just the last thing, I'd just like to ask you if you're comfortable um, just to share with each other something that you'll be leaving here with today. <laughs>